Hey y'all, my name's Cody Ames, and I'm going to be talking today about the complex figure known as Herod the Great. This results from my background, which comes from Texas Tech University, where I got a BA and MA in classics, and then I went to the University of Leicester, and I got a, another master's in classical archaeology of the Mediterranean. And as a result of those two degrees, that's kind of fostered a passion for um, the Near East and the complex relationships between the Greeks, the Romans, and the inhabitants of um, the Near East. And as a result of that, those complex agencies, um, that kind of spurred this question of who actually was Herod the Great? Um, depending on who you ask, they have very strong opinions about who this guy actually was. So that that prompted the question, who was this guy really, and what can we look to as evidence of his, his reign? And that kind of bred the, this very, very long investigation, which we won't have time to get all through today, but hopefully we can generate enough of interest to, to finish out this lecture series. But today I just kind of wanted to start with a general overview of the investigation and the framework for my investigation. And hopefully uh, there will be enough interest out there that we can keep this thing going. So without further ado, um, let me go ahead and, and start the lecture. So this lecture is about the kingship of Herod the Great and his enrollment of Greco-Roman architecture and practices, specifically athletic games. Herod, it seems, made a deliberate break from his Jewish kingdom for the electrifying waves of the Greco-Roman world. Herod's idea was faced many changes over its history, but none more drastic in terms of architecture and culture than during his reign amidst the Roman domination in Judea, a period that begins with Pompey the Great in 63 BC and ends with the Muslim invasion in the 650s AD. Herod died in 4 BC. Herod the Great is widely regarded as both a Roman sympathizer and a promoter of Greco-Roman culture. He is believed to have underwritten the construction of monumental buildings, including harbors, temples, arches, as well as theaters and amphitheaters. And we get a lot of information from Josephus. Moreover, he has also instituted Greco-Roman games in Judea and helped to save the athletic festival at Olympia, the Olympics. These architectural and cultural endeavors suggest Herod may have been influenced by Greek designs, which were filtered through Roman culture and that he may have enrolled him in order to substantiate his kingdom. The aims of this lecture are therefore twofold. One, to offer an explanation for Herod's adoption of Greco-Roman architecture and Greco-Roman games. And two, to better understand the socio-political crafting of Herod's kingship. To this end, I will look into possible relationships between Herod, the Roman aristocracy, and Jewish norms as documented by ancient accounts, by authors such as Josephus, Tacitus, Suetonius, and Vitruvius. I will also examine the physical remains of Herod's building program in Caesarea Maritima and Jerusalem in conjunction with descriptions by Josephus. This examination will also focus on Greco-Roman athletics as a mechanism complementary to his enrollment of architecture. Our journey will begin with Herod's three trips to Rome in the years 40, 17 to 16, and 13 to 12 BC in an effort to attain the crown and bring stability back to Judea as detailed by accounts of Josephus. This section will detail relationships Herod is reported to have forged while in Rome with its aristocracy and its architecture. The next section will discuss select architectural remains from Herod's building program at Caesarea Maritima as revealed by Avner Rabin and Kenneth Hallam, Jerusalem as revealed by Ehud Netzer and Rachel Laris Chasse, and again, the ancient accounts of the Jewish general Josephus who figures prominently in this investigation. Along with select architectural remains in Caesarea Maritima and Jerusalem, I will examine other Greco-Roman architectures and other cities in the Roman East, Alexandria, Priene, Virginia, to name a few, in order to link Herod's program with other Greco-Roman cities via their architecture. In conjunction with these particular examples of architecture, I will also attempt to explicate how Herod used Greco-Roman games to appeal to foreign cultures, particularly Rome. 
In addition to this segment, I will look to Vitruvius in order to get a better sense of what constitutes Greek and Roman architecture. What is Greek and Roman architecture? The latter will help better distinguish, I contend, the ways Herod utilized Greco-Roman architectures in his kingdom. By connecting the material remains and architectures with written accounts of Judea, I will try to tease out what effects Herod's building program and inclusion of Greco-Roman games had on Herod's kingship, along with the socio-political ramifications they had with Rome. I'll start this process with the architecture, then move to the written accounts to better understand what historians regard as Herod's passionate obsessions. The third and final section will consist of brief histories of Greco-Roman games in an effort to draw out the distinction between Greco-Roman indulgence and Judean rejection. The games to be studied will include the athletic festival competitions at Olympia and the origins and eventual con uh, contribution of the gladiatorial games in Rome. Building on these premises, I will argue that Herod reconstituted his Judean province in accordance with the latest Greco-Roman trends. So that is the framework for this lecture series. Now let's get into Herod's actual histories. And let's begin that with his craft of kingship. So Herod has to negotiate a difficult socio-political situation. He has to both appeal to the power of Rome and its aristocracy and to a local population that values Jewish, i.e. non-Greco-Roman traditions. It is in light of this delicate situation that I ask, why did Herod enroll Greco-Roman architecture, material culture, and entertainment? There are several possible answers to this question. One, this provided a basis for Herod to distinguish himself in his kingship. Two, this helped to generate a cosmopolitan atmosphere that appealed to diverse interests, or not, as the case may be with Jewish norms. Three, this was a way of distancing himself from the native populace of Judea who abstained from Greco-Roman culture under the observance of the Jewish religion. These answers are not mutually exclusive and indeed are all part of an agenda aimed at crafting his kingship. In order to better understand this process, we'll begin with the kingship's history in Judea, a history that will help to elucidate the relationship between the craft of kingship and the socio-political relations, both external and internal. So the Jewish kingship came into existence after a period known as the phase of the judges, when a succession of 12 leaders named judges were called upon to help the 12 tribes of Israel. At this time of Jewish history, the Jews found themselves at odds with their surrounding neighbors, putting both their culture and their land in danger. The Hebrew God, Jehovah, Yahweh, I am, then appointed a set of men and women to free their compatriots when conditions were at their worst. Judges tells us that the people of Israel began serving Jehovah, but soon fell prey to the foreign pressures of idolatry in a similar fashion as the inhabitants of Judea in the first century BC. The Jews did not drive out the Jebusites, which is a polytheistic culture, who inhabited Jerusalem before the Jews, so the Jebusites dwelt together with the Jews in Jerusalem and Judea, assimilating cultures much like the Romans did under Herod's reign. This inclusion of foreign ideals is present in the Herodian kingship, which, as Schwartz suggests, adopted Roman architecture and Roman culture, i.e. a more Roman administrative organization. The changes were made mostly in the Jewish ruling class and range in degree from little to great. Continuing with the story of Jewish expansion, the Jews also attacked Bethel, another polytheistic culture present in the area, and Jehovah helped them to attain victory. The Jews then sent men to spy out Bethel, and when the spies saw a man coming out of the city, they sought entry into the city in exchange for the man's mercy. The text goes on to say that the man showed the Jews the entrance into the city, they then attacked the city and, keeping to the word, let the man and all of his family go. The man, who was now a former citizen of Jerusalem under the control of the Jebusites at that time, then went to, lead, then went to the land of the Hittites and built a city called Luz. The man who showed the entrance into the city took the Jews' gift 
and was given his life as a symbolic representation of performing well in the eyes of the Jews. Given that the Jews are now in control of Jerusalem and that we have an understanding of who makes up Judea, roughly speaking, at that time, we can now look more closely at the action of permitting foreign influences within the confines of Jewish settlements. This inclusion of outside cultures would prove to be a contributing factor for the direction Jews would later follow, culminating with the Greco-Roman influences in the first century BC. The Hebrews allowed outside influences to lead them away from Jehovah and his plan by administering strange deities and social customs that paved the path for civil strife, which in turn allowed for a cultural overhaul, which the Romans advanced. According to the Torah, the nation of Israel was being punished by the Hebrew God because of their blasphemies and idolatries. Thus, he was the only source the Jews could look to in order to find peace. It was during this time of conflict that the judges were sent to give Israel serenity again. The reign of the judges was ended by the acclamation of the Jewish people, and it was because of the Jewish unrest that the kingship was put into place. There are some similarities between the state of the Jews during the time of the first king and during that of Herod. A radical change in the status quo brings about strains that influence confusion. In the case of the end of the era of the judges, Jehovah instituted a new format for the military, as well as overhaul living conditions for every son and daughter of Israel. The Constitution lists stipulations by which the king will reign over the Israelites. I don't usually like to, to quote long passages here, but in this case, I think it's necessary. So in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 8, verses 11 through 14, we get this. The king will take the sons and appoint them for his own chariots and his horsemen. And some will run before his chariots. He will appoint captains over his thousands and captains over his fifties. He will set some to plow his ground and reap his harvest. And some to make his weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. He will take the daughters to be perfumers, cooks, and bakers. And he will take the best of the fields, vineyards, and olive groves and give them to his servants. So Herod, according to Josephus, seems to have taken these stipulations and used them as the basis for his eccentric, i.e., again, non-Jewish lifestyle. The last thing that we'll briefly talk about is the reign of Herod the Great. So we've covered a long period of time, long period of history, and a very short amount of time. But that sets the framework for Herod the Great's reign, which again is juggling two superpowers at this time. We've got the Near East, and we've also got Rome. So from the rule of the judges to the adoption of the first Hebrew king, to the institution of a Roman-appointed client king, Herod now found himself on the throne of Judea. But his path to the throne was, in, was indirect and uncertain as the office itself. Herod was first promised the king by Cassius Longinus, who served with Herod's father, Antipater, however, Cassius died while in Philippi in 42 BC, thus rendering his promise to Herod worthless. In response, Herod, stripped of his promised crown, traveled to Rome in 40 BC during the winter months to make new ties with the Roman aristocracy. On his way to Rome from Judea, Herod stopped in Alexandria, where he was enticed to stay by Cleopatra VII. She is reported to have offered him a senior military post in her service, but Herod was eager to get to Rome to advance his ties with the Roman Senate. While in Alexandria, Herod would have presumably noticed Hellenistic architecture, which may have been a, contribut a contributing factor in his own building program. Roller, a, an expert in Herod's uh, building program, poses the argument even further by noticing that before 30 B.C., Contacts between Alexandria and Judea were steady and strong, even if they were not always positive. And those who were involved in both Cleopatra and Herod's court could have been informative to Herod's interest in Alexandria's innovative architecture. He goes on to say in his building program of Herod the Great that there was a general movement from Alexandria to Judea. And he even catalogs names of presumed Greeks who were influential in the design of Herod's building program. 
In addition, patrons of Damascus, Kos, and Sparta were present in Herod's court. It seems there is no accident Herodian architecture patronage extended to those cities. At this point in the story, based on Josephus' accounts, we have proven that Herod has seen Greco-Roman architecture in, Ju in Alexandria. But we have yet to prove if he adopts it for his own building program in Judea, or even if Alexandrian architecture qualifies as Greco-Roman. From this juncture, let us proceed with Herod's trip to find further evidence of his interactions with Greco-Roman architecture and culture in an effort to determine if he was influenced by them. After a brief stint in Alexandria, Herod reached Rome near the end of 40 BC, where he met with Antoninus and Valerius Masala Corvinus, who in turn introduced him to other high-ranking officials in the Senate. Masala, a praetor suffectus, was a supporter of Octavian. So while speaking in the Senate, Masala opted for Herod to be the king of Judea to deal with the Parthian problem. The motion passed uncontested in the Senate, so three years after Herod was initially promised the crown of Judea, he received it in 40 BC. To continue the history of Herod's rise to the Judean kingship, the journey, as mentioned above, was far from easy. During his initial 40 BC trip to Rome to help solidify relations, Herod found an even greater gift from the Roman Senate than he desired after sailing to Rome with the expectations of merely restoring some order in Judea from Parthian dominance. Antoninus, along with the Senate, found it to be in the best interest of the Roman people to appoint Herod, king of the Jews, to help suppress the Parthian, Parthian war. This recommendation by Antoninus may have been based on Herod's readiness to adopt Greco-Roman practices, architecture, and religion as well as endorsing a cosmopolitan environment, thus instituting a distinguishing element in his kingship, again, by promoting pro-Roman, non-Jewish norms. The uncertain Roman Senate was on the brink of a civil war, and any encouragement from the, from the provinces was warmly welcomed by the Roman aristocracy. We are able to illuminate Judeo-Roman affairs based on ancient accounts, we get a large portion of our information on this period from the Jewish writer Josephus, who had first-hand knowledge of the war, and also of many circulating manuscripts of the time period. One of Josephus' most relied upon sources for Herod's building program is a member of Herod's internal circle, Nicholas of Damascus. According to Tar, Nicholas was one of Herod's closest advisors and a daily companion, as well as the king's most important ambassador to Roman authority. Nicholas eventually even formed a close relationship with Augustus himself. Most of Nicholas's writings don't survive, except for when Josephus mentions him, but Josephus relies heavily upon Nicholas as a primary source of Herod and Augustus's affairs since Josephus was born in 37 AD and did not have firsthand knowledge. I've listed previous accounts by Josephus, but it is important to understand the significance and authenticity of his claims. Other available manuscripts were deemed unworthy by Josephus, so he st strove to write an accurate and neutral history of the events which took place during the Jewish War. He found some reports to have been created by individuals who did not have adequate means, he meant first-hand knowledge, to put forth an effort and others Josephus considered to prejudiced. Present-day scholars consider Josephus to be the most accurate of historians on the matter. Since there is a reliable source for Judea at this time, inferences about Herod are possible. By showing favor for Caesar and Roman religion by means of great games, uh, for example, the Quinquennial Games uh, presented in Caesarea Maritima and Jerusalem, which will be further discussed below, Herod also demonstrated his cultivation of Greco-Roman deities, such as Apollo. Josephus sheds light on Herod's helpful attitude towards adopting polytheistic gods when he speaks concerning his other gifts that were impossible to count. Josephus says he freely gave gifts to cities, both in Syria and in Greece, as well as every other place he came to on his expeditions. Herod seems according to Josephus, to have given greatly to many Greco-Roman cities 
in an effort to gain acceptance. Josepha says he gave foreign cultures the money that was necessary to perform public works that they could not do on their own because they were not able to produce the necessary revenue. The greatest and most illustrious of all Herod's works was a reconstruction of the Temple of Apollo at Rhodes, which he built at his own expense. But in addition to the temple, Herod also gave the citizens of Rhodes many talents of silver for the repair of their fleet. We know that Herod gave a great amount of money to Rhodes, but why? Why would he do that? A possible explanation may stem from the long-established relationship Rhodes had with Rome. And by helping one of Rome's oldest allies, it would add further support to the alliance between Rome and Judea. There is also evidence that Jews were present on Rhodes as early as the mid-2nd century BC. Suetonius also mentions a grammarian who lectured every Sabbath, which may have also prompted Herod to help Rhodes. In any case, the sanctuary to the Pythian Apollo that Herod rebuilt was located towards the northern part of the old city close to the Acropolis. Although nothing remains of Herod's initial construction, four Doric columns and part of its architecture have been recreated. The Timenos is adjoined on the south by the gymnasium and stadium, which is of special interest given Herod's restoration of the Olympic Games. It would appear he paid particular attention to Greco-Roman games as a means to impress his Roman friends. Now, I'm going to go ahead and end that there because I feel like that's a, a, a nice conclusion. That kind of frames Herod's rise. So at this point, we're going to need to learn the Judean attitudes towards Herod, the Roman attitudes towards Herod, and also what constituted those attitudes. What made Jews, largely speaking, Romans, Greeks, what made them have those particular attitudes towards this very, very complex picture? Again, let me end it there, but I, I can't stop uh, this video without first giving a shout out to, to my two boys, Jack and Matt. Love you, boys. And um, thank you for watching, and hopefully I, we get to do this again soon. Bye.